great to sing together, isn't it? It's great to just be together, to sing to the Lord, to let the praises of our voices acknowledge Him and wonder. What a great thing. Well, it's our time to study the Word of God together, and so I'll ask you to take your Bibles with me this morning and turn in them to 2 Peter chapter 2. 2 Peter chapter 2, and this morning we will begin really to focus our attention on identifying that which is false. Been talking about strengthening our faith, having a faith that finishes well, and one of the aspects in order to ensure that we finish well is the necessity for identifying that which is false. And the reality is I don't really want to get too far into it this morning as we'll be returning to this over the next few weeks together. But you'll notice in chapter 2 that the text indicates for us that there is a change in direction. That's the whole idea when you're looking at Scripture. You notice things like that in the whole word at the beginning, that contrasting word that begins in verse 1. But that's a change in direction. Even though the entire section gives us another defense, if you will, for the certainty we have for our faith. But it's a change in direction. It's It's a change in direction for the Apostle Paul from telling us who we are and what we have in Christ and how we are to live to now how to identify that which is false. So I want to read for us verses 1 through 10 just so that we can get it in our minds. Beginning in verse 1, but false prophets also arose among the people, just as there will also be false prophets among you who will secretly introduce destructive heresies, even denying the master who bought them, bringing swift destruction upon themselves. And many will follow their sensuality, and because of them the way of the truth will be maligned. And in their greed, they will exploit you with false words. Their judgment from long ago is not idle, and their destruction is not asleep. For if God did not spare angels when they sinned, but cast them into hell and committed them to pits of darkness reserved for judgment, and did not spare the ancient world, but preserved Noah, a preacher of righteousness, with seven others, when he brought a flood upon the world of the ungodly. And if he condemned the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah to destruction by reducing them to ashes, having made them an example to those who would live ungodly thereafter. And if he rescued righteous Lot, oppressed by the sensual conduct of unprincipled men, for by what he saw and heard, that righteous man, while living among them, felt his righteous soul tormented day after day with their lawful deeds. So if God has done that, then the Lord knows how to rescue the godly from temptation and to keep the unrighteous under punishment for the day of judgment. And especially those who indulge the flesh in its corrupt desires and despise authority. Daring, self-willed, they do not tremble when they revile angelic majesties. I trust that you noticed when I read that, that the first word, like I highlighted, tells us that Peter is making a great contrast to the picture that he painted for us in chapter 1 about finishing well in the faith. Before we get to his thoughts here, and before he ends his thoughts on what he said in the first chapter, he has one final point to make. Here it is. Here's his final point. Here's his exclamation point, really, at the end of the sentence of chapter 1. It is always eternal destruction that awaits those who are false. That's the exclamation point. 
It is always eternal destruction that awaits those who are false. That is simply to say that we don't ever need to be deceived. We don't ever need to be confused about the truth, no matter how long it may take to be revealed. Eternal destruction is always the end result for the false. Always. Peter wants us to know that. He wants us to understand that great truth. He, he wanted us to know that what was true of Him in chapter 1, in Him telling us what God had done for us in our salvation, and how we are to diligently walk in it, so that we're fruitful and faithful in our Christian lives to God. He wants us to know that what He has told us is true of every true prophet of God. What Peter has told us in chapter 1 is a picture of a true prophet of God. Juxtaposed to the picture that he's going to paint now beginning in chapter 2. What he has showed us and what he has told us concerning what God has given us by way of our salvation, what God has done for us, how God has equipped us with everything pertaining to life and godliness, and how we are to be diligent to carry out and walk in that faith in all of those things so that we are faithful, so that we are fruitful to God. That picture is a true prophet. That's what the true prophet tells people. That's not what the false prophet tells people. That's why Peter ended in chapter 1 with those telling words by telling us that the true message of God was never produced by human imagination or intellectual speculation. Remember what he said? Know this first of all, verse 20, that no prophecy of Scripture is a matter of one's own interpretation, for no prophecy was ever made by an act of human will. But men moved by the Holy Spirit spoke from God. In reality, the Apostle Peter is saying to us that the Bible from the very first words of Genesis all the way to the last words of Revelation are not the stuff of fables. It is not the stuff of fairy tales. This is not a mythological book written by some kind of Greek philosopher down through the ages of history. Nothing in this book, nothing in the Scriptures itself came from the mind or will of man. We can count on it. We can trust it. We can know that to be the case. It is not a human record of man's musings about a God of his own making. No. This is the true and authoritative fact book. It is the fact book that God has given to us about how He has entered into creation so that His creation might be saved from the penalty of their guilt against their Creator. That they might be saved by Him. And so that, beloved, is the very essence of the true prophet of God. The true prophet of God always speaks the truth of the Word of God as God has given it. According to its meaning. According to what God says it means. And therefore, to contrast... To contrast that reality is what Peter gives us here in chapter 2. And it could not be more stark. It could not be any less cautionary to us. And the results could not be any less vivid. We realize from chapter 1, and when we think about it and think through it all as we have done over the last several weeks, just what it is that God has done for us, there is no reason to ever doubt the certainty of our faith. 
Because it is rests in the very character and nature of God Himself. That vivid picture, that stunning reality that God is the one who saves us. That God is the one who equips us. That it is God who sustains us. That it is God who gives us the faith to be lived out. And it is God who empowers us by the Holy Spirit in order to walk diligently in those things that cause us to be fruitful and useful. That stark picture that vivid picture of what true Christianity is from a true prophet spoken to us by God now is contrast with a false prophet. And so this is a warning to us. It's a warning about the reality of the introduction of deception. The introduction of deception to the claims of truth. And the person and proven result of that person speaking lies is eternal destruction every time. Make no mistake about it. Now when you think about it, when you, when you read a text like this and when you approach a, a scriptural passage like this in the Bible and you think about it, it would be great... It would be wonderful as Christians if we never had to weary ourselves with the potential of being lied to. Wouldn't that be wonderful? If once and for all, when God saved us, we then entered into the glorious realm of a place in which there were no lies. The place in which you knew you'd never be lied to by anyone. It would be nice if all people in the world simply spoke the truth. We didn't have the capacity for speaking those things that are false. But sadly, because of sin, that is not the case. We are all patently aware of that. We live in a fallen world. A world that is in bondage to sin and therefore slaves to sin. We are slaves to the father of lies who is Satan himself. And so we ought to expect liars to come. In fact, we are warned throughout Scripture of that reality. As you read, you continue, you pick up your Bible any or every day, and you read through the New Testament, you quickly realize that this world, while it is a dangerous place for anybody to live, it is especially dangerous for the Christian. The world around us is a dangerous place by way of its philosophies and, and, and ideas and the traditions of men, but it is especially dangerous for the Christian. Why? Because when you read through the New Testament, you quickly realize that those forces of evil are all aligned against you. They are continually trying to draw you away from God. That is the intent of the father of lies. And so we are continually warned in Scripture to be on guard. Ephesians 6, put on the full armor of God. Because the danger is never more perilous. We are to watch carefully. We are to be scrutinizers we are to rightly challenge if necessary what we see and what we hear therefore we must be people who are prepared for that reality because the danger comes in the form of a false teacher the danger comes in the form of a false prophet. Someone peddling false words as if they're true words. Now why, why do I say that those are the most dangerous for the Christian? Why do I say that, that false teachers, this form in which are part of the, the whole scheme of the realm of wickedness, why that is the most dangerous for the Christian. And I'll say it this way, because the false words, the false teachings are so subtle. They are subtle as weapons of war. 
The most dangerous weapon in warfare is the weapon that is disguised as something that is not a weapon. That is the most dangerous. And so it is with false teachers. They will always appear among us as true teachers, true prophets. False teachers who represent themselves as truth teachers. Appearing as those who are giving that which is true and what should be followed. Appearing as if they are speaking that which is true and yet, but they are deadly dangerous for your eternal soul. And yet we need not be surprised. We need not be surprised. Notice, notice what Peter says. Notice how Peter says this in the first verse because he's, he's saying to us, listen, nothing is new. Nothing is new. Notice, but false prophets also arose among the people just as there will also be false teachers among you. And don't, don't miss what he's saying. Don't miss part of the drive of an intent of why Peter writes what he writes. He's saying there were false teachers among the people. Listen, the people he's talking about are among the Old Testament Jews. There were false prophets among them and you can expect it also. We might even say it this way. History is cyclical. History is cyclical. What has been returns to be again. What has been returns to be again, and therefore the situation applies to us. Nothing is new. We should not be surprised that false teachers are in and among the evangelical church of today. This is not anything new. The Old Testament people had them among them. The first audience of Peter's letter that he wrote to here in 2 Peter had them among them. And here we are, 2,000 plus years later, and hearing the Word of God in our ears from the voice of Peter as he's driven along by the Spirit of God to speak from God, telling us, listen, we don't need to be surprised. They'll be among us also. Just as there were false teachers and false prophets among the ancient Jews, just as there were false teachers and false prophets among the early church, there are still false teachers and false prophets in the times in which we are living. And the greatest danger, the greatest danger for us today is the reality that they are within evangelicalism even now. We think, wow, okay, if false teachers are going to be around, we, we better guard against them. We better lock the doors. We better put up the gate. We better ensure that the compound in which we exist as Christians is so secure that no false teacher gets in. Listen, they're already in. They're already in. And they're spewing their false theological lies even though they are labeled by them as if they're true. In the past, it was things like Gnosticism. The idea that the flesh was corrupt, but the spirit wasn't, and that you could have a higher knowledge of God, and that somehow you had a relationship with God. It really didn't matter what happened in the physical realm. Do whatever you want, as long as your spirit is okay. It seems to me that that goes on today. That lie is being perpetuated over and over again in different packaging. It was the denial of the deity of Jesus Christ that came in in the early 300s. There was the denial of inerrancy of Scripture, the openness of God theory, the idea that God still is learning, that God doesn't know everything, that He's just learning The denial of justification by faith alone. 
by current living today seminary professors that say that? Easy believism. The emerging church movement of some years ago. All the way to today's critical race theory being embraced by the Southern Baptist Convention. A theory that says you cannot really truly understand what the text means until you look at it through the context of race. Until you look at it through the context of race relations among people. You can't really understand what the Bible means by what it says and therefore how to apply it into the life and the meanings of today until you look at it through the context of the relationships between ethnicities today. And until you understand it through that, you can't really understand what God meant by what He said. That's critical race theory. That there really is no objective truth until you look at it through that, so that you have to look at it through your own subjective thinking in order to arrive at some kind of truth that you have really placed upon the text. The subjectivity rules your views. Or the twin brother of critical race theory called social gospel. Social gospel. That in order for you to reach people with the gospel, you have to meet all of their felt social ills. You have to accomplish all of their social ills before there'll ever be any kind of need for the gospel. That seems counterintuitive to me, especially when I read John chapter 6, when Jesus wouldn't even feed the people who came to him the next morning. He certainly wasn't interested in their social ills. All of these have taken place in the past in one form or another. Many are still with us today, just wrapped in new, different, glittering packages. But they're the same lies. Same lies. And therefore, there is nothing more important for us than to be able to identify that which is false. I need to say this for us to hear. The greatest danger that we face today is not what is happening right now in our world or what may be happening in our world in the future. That's not the greatest danger to us, folks. So many people in the evangelical community today are so afraid of what's happening in the world today, what's happening through this physical reality that's taking place in our world. Listen, the greatest danger to us is not whether we may get sick from some kind of physical enemy. Let's not kid ourselves. Every single one of us sitting here today, every single one of us watching today is one day going to get sick from something. We're going to get sick. And let me, let me just share a revelation with all of us. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 27 says that it has been appointed to man once to die. <gasps> Shock! We're all going to die. That's news. Put it on the headlines. Tweet it out. Probably get blocked. Probably get censored. One day we're all going to die. We're going to die of something. Some of us are going to die because we're chronologically past the age of living. 100% guaranteed everybody's going to die unless Christ comes first. The important thing for us to have before us is the truth of Jesus Christ. The most important thing to have before us is to cling to Christ. So the greatest danger for us is not the physical danger that might be out in the world. No, the greatest danger to all of us is the fact that there are people, there are people who speak as if they are speaking on behalf of God, and yet they have nothing to say. They are messengers of Satan. And it's curious to me as a pastor how many Christians today are not being very careful to do everything in their control and by their power 
to protect themselves from that. They're doing more to protect themselves against physical harm than they are to protect themselves against spiritual harm. We are working far too much on what might preserve my physical temporary life than what I need to know in order to help me on my spiritual eternal life. You see, beloved, this is the emphasis that Peter is making. This is the emphasis he's making. Why? Because that helps give us certainty. Certainty by way of finished example that destruction awaits all who are false. Destruction awaits those who spread that which is false if it's not true. And so if we're going to have a steadfast faith, if we're going to have a faith that finishes well, then we better be careful to observe and to act in spiritual matters with discrimination. Let me say that again. If we are going to finish well in our faith, then we better act and learn to act and observe carefully as Christians and act carefully as Christians with, in spiritual matters with discrimination. We need to be discriminating people. The Christian must be that person who rightly sifts through the information that they hear about anything and thereby make a discrimination as to its truthfulness. Just look at the multiplicity of information being offered to us today and the theories being brought forth. Simply sift through the solutions being given to us just in the current crisis in our world right now. Just sift through them. Look at all the experts that are writing and telling us what we must do if we are to remain safe and physically out of harm's way. By, just by way of implication, they are saying, don't factor in God. Don't, don't, don't add God to the equation. Don't put Him there. Don't worry about what He's commanded. You're in charge of your health. To do anything other than what we say is utter foolishness. That's what they're saying. Oh, certainly they're not using those words, but that's what they're saying. Factor out God. Factor Him out. Listen, beloved, if you will not begin to discriminate between what is true and false, you will be, and possibly already are being, quietly duped into doing all kinds of things that are strange and irrational that find no basis in trusting in our holy, sovereign God. That is simply to say that in all of life, it really doesn't matter what it is, in all of life we must be people who discriminate between what is true and what is false. And so in light of that principle, in light of that reality, what is it that we look for when it comes to false prophets and false teachers? What is it that we look for? Well, I just want to give us three general factors to be aware of. Three general factors that we need to be aware of when it comes to identifying the false. And I'll list them for us and then we'll quickly talk about them. Here's the three general factors. Number one, just because it's new doesn't mean it's true. Let me say that again. Just because it's new doesn't mean it's true. Two, secondly, just because it's popular doesn't mean it's true. Just because it's popular doesn't mean it's true. And then three, the third general factor is this. Just because it's being taught in a church doesn't mean it's true. Just because it's taught in the church doesn't mean it's true. If we are to be discriminating as Christians, 
And we cannot be duped into thinking that since, number one, it is new, then it must be true. It seems rather obvious to say that. And yet this is part of the root problem. This is part of the root problem in evangelicalism than what is happening today in the evangelical church. We have become what I like to call bandwagon Christians. Bandwagon Christians. In other words, whatever's new that comes down the line, then I'm going to jump on the bandwagon. I'm going to ride it out. This is very popular today. The biblically illiterate church of today seems to just jump on and ride with a smile on its face to everything that comes down that seems new. Here's part of the reason why it happens. Because we've convinced ourselves that because we live in the 21st century, because we have learned so much from history, because we have seen so much over time, because we have passed and advanced so much in our understanding and things in general, overall, in every area of life, then anytime someone comes up with what appears to be a new idea, we have to buy it. We have to accept it because it seems advanced. It seems rather beyond. We've subtly convinced ourselves already just from how we think about ourselves that we are so advanced that it was born out of an advanced understanding. But if we're wise, if we're wise, then we'll embrace what Peter says. Notice verse 1. There were false prophets among the people, just as, or in the same way, there will be false teachers among you. In other words, this is how we should view history. That's how we should view history. What is happening now has happened before. What is going on now has gone on before. There is nothing new. As it has been, so it shall be. Well, we've heard a, one preacher say this in the past. It's in the Old Testament. His name was Solomon. In Ecclesiastes, what did he say? There is nothing new where? under the sun. There's nothing new. The lies today are the lies of the past. They're the same. They just come in different wrapping. The world in which we live today in the 21st century is the same as it's always been. You say, how so? I'll tell you how so. The world of the past was fallen and the world today is fallen. Sin has affected it all. The world today still thinks in a fallen way. It determines life from a fallen perspective. The same way it did in the past. Ever since the fall of man in Genesis 3, the world has remained the same. In fact, you notice that even Peter, in writing, acknowledges this of those, even the false prophets acknowledge that. Because in chapter 3 it says, for they, when they maintain this, maintain what? That the, we say there's a promise of Christ coming and that they say ever since the fathers fell asleep, in other words, in our history, ever since our ancestor died, all continues just as it was from the beginning of creation. Nothing's changed. It's all the same. Even they acknowledge that reality. The world is the same. Now someone's going to say, someone's going to come up and they're going to say, well, isn't life different now than it was over a hundred years ago? I mean, after all, we live differently, right? We travel faster. We use computers. Some of you are reading the Bible on an electronic device. They didn't do that a hundred years ago. And I would say, all of that's true. That is true. But those are just superficial differences. Those are just superficial things of modernity. What I'm speaking about is that mankind in respect to his troubles in life itself. The troubles of life itself aren't no different. 
man still has trouble in his relationship to God. Listen, beloved, and that's how we need to see it. That's how we need to look at the world. See, when someone comes up and you share the gospel with them and they say, well, listen, I don't believe that, we can say to them, listen, I know you don't believe that. I know you don't believe that. You know why? Because God says you're suppressing that truth in your own unrighteousness. Well, I, I don't believe in God. I know you say you don't believe in God, but guess what? God put it in your heart. God put it there, down deep inside, in your inner man. You know, you know you're just denying it. You know. And to say you don't believe it doesn't remove it. This is how it is. That's how we need to see it. When we see it that way, there's only one conclusion to make. Man is no different today than the day Adam and Eve sinned against God in the garden. And so when someone comes along and proclaims some new way of dealing with man's troubles, some new morality, some new philosophy of life, because they finally figured out just how it is we can all get together and get along, I finally figured it out. You as a discriminating Christian, here's that new information. And you say, yeah, but what's God say? You hear that and you go, I know what the Bible says the answer to man's problem is. It's not what you say and it's not your philosophy driven up by mankind. No, that's not an attempt to solve the problem. That just worsens the problem. You know that any attempt other than the way that ends in Christ Jesus will only end in eternal disaster. And so you can say, I'm not going that way. I'm not following that direction. Listen, this, and I'm not really not political in the pulpit, but I have to say this. This is why no discriminating person in America can vote for a Democrat. And I'm not telling you how to vote. I'm just saying the Democrats believe that you can kill babies. Rightly, they say that. How could anybody who professes to know Jesus Christ ever stand with that? It's impossible. Listen, we have to be discriminating. Mankind is the same. There is nothing new under the sun. Of course, that leads to the next second general factor. The first factor is just because it's new doesn't mean it's true. The second factor is this, just because it's popular doesn't mean it's true. This goes back to the whole reality of bandwagon Christianity that I think is so prevalent in the church today. Notice what Peter says about the false teacher's message. Notice what he says, verse 2. Verse 2. And many will follow their sensuality. Many will follow their sensuality. Now here's what Peter is implying with those words. False teachers are going to speak. They're going to spew their lies. And they're going to garner, listen, a popularity among the people listening. They're going to garner a popularity. Listen, the heretic Joel Osteen has 28,000 people sitting listening to him today. They garner a popularity. Many will follow. That means, shockingly, they're being believed. They're being believed. This is part of what makes it so shocking today about critical race theory and social gospel. So many are believing it. And those who are following it are no longer believing what the Bible clearly teaches. But simply because it's popular. Because it's gained a crowd under the name Christian. 
And because it's gained a crowd under the name and under the guise and under the label of being Christian, then it must be true. Because after all, listen, they all can't be wrong. They all can't be wrong. Well, let me ask a question this morning. How big of a crowd does it need to be and still be wrong? How big of a crowd? Two? Ten? Twenty? Hundred thousand? Million? I don't know the number to that answer, but I know this, that before the worldwide flood, all but eight people died. All but eight people were wrong. In fact, Peter brings this up in chapter 2. God didn't spare the ancient world. He preserved Noah, the preacher of righteousness, with seven others when he brought flood upon the world of the ungodly. There was only eight in that crowd. I don't know the population of the world back in the days of Noah, but it was rather large. Peter saying, listen, this was true in times past. It's true today. Many will follow their sensuality. You know the implication of that? Peter's saying, but don't allow yourself to be one of them. Don't allow yourself to be one of them. Be discriminating. Is something true because of popularity? Is that why it's true? No. That's not what makes something true. What is true and right is the Scriptures alone. That defines what's true. No matter how the crowd is standing with us, no matter how many are on our side, crowds don't prove a church to be true. Crowds don't prove a Bible to be true. Honoring God. Honoring God in His Word. Show it to be true. So listen, beloved. Just because it's new doesn't mean it's true. History tells us otherwise. And just because it's popular doesn't mean it's true. Even though many will follow their sensuality, don't, don't be one of them. Don't be one of those. And then finally, just because it's taught in the church doesn't make it true. You say, well, I didn't think you were going to say that. Notice what Peter, Peter, Peter says. Back in verse 1, false prophets also were among, among, among the people just as there will also be false teachers among you. Where are they? Among you. Among us. If you were to survey the entire New Testament, nearly every book refers to that reality. False teachers among them. In fact, Paul told the Ephesian elders in Acts 20 to watch out for themselves because false teachers don't only come from outside, they come from within. He said, one will rise from among you. Judas was of the twelve. That means, beloved, that simply because you hear something in the church, that that alone is no guarantee that it's true. Just because you come to the church and you hear from the church and, and people talk about the Bible in the church and we, we open the Bible together in the church, just because it comes in the church doesn't make it true. That's no guarantee it's true. Because just as there are false believers in the church, so too there are also false teachers who teach that which is a lie. In fact, we have become so accustomed to this that when we get in discussions with other believers, many times we make the points of our discussion not from what the Word of God says, but rather from what the pastor says. You ever done that? 
You're in a discussion, a theological discussion, some biblical discussion with somebody, and rather than turning to the Word of God, you say, but my pastor says. Or my favorite Bible teacher says. Now listen, I'm a pastor. It's very flattering to be quoted. It's flattering. It's a blessing from God to be trusted to give the truth. But I would hope that that trust is founded on a personal study of the Word of God and a conviction of the truth rightly divided like the Berean, ensuring that what is being said is of the truth and from the truth. I would hope that's why you're quoting it. It's wonderful. We live in great times. We have great Bible teachers in our day. Great, wonderful Bible teachers. We can, we can bring them up in a nanosecond on our electronic devices and hear any number of, of Bible teaching that, that is called truth. And we have trusted Bible teachers. Those whom we trust. We've, we've listened for years. We've scrutinized for years. And we can trust. And we, we found it trustworthy in them. But woe to us if we do not ensure that what we are trusting in is accurate to the rightly divided Word of God. Woe to us. Can I get lulled into the place where we think that any one of those who stands up in the church is truth teaching. Can I get lulled into a place where just because it's said in the walls of this building in which we meet calling ourselves Fellowship Bible Church that just because it's said in here by somebody that it's truth. They may be a false teacher. We dare not be duped by it. Now, Peter is going to give us specific qualities of false teachers. Specific qualities. We're going to get into those over time. But let me just say this on a simple note. They are false. Not Peter's list of them, but the people he's talking about. They themselves are false. They're false as compared to what Peter showed us the true prophet to be in chapter 1. They're not that. That's the true prophet. They're false prophets. The true only give truth of Scripture. They don't give their own ideas. They don't give their own thinking. They don't give their own thoughts on it. Their message is false. They give destructive heresies and false words. And they have false lives. That's the character of them. Everything about them is false. Don't miss that. That's the great contrast going on here. What you saw in picture number one was true. What you see in picture number two is contrasted. It is all false. So we're having a warning. This is like a flashing light in the center of town where we've been warned. And so we need to be careful. We need to be careful. We need to be vigilant. We need to be discriminating. We need to trust in our sovereign God and not the newness or the crowd or being from some religion. No, let's take every thought captive to the Word of God. Do like Paul said to Timothy, show yourself approved, one who rightly divides the Word of truth. When we do that, I trust God would be honored by our obedience, even if that means we have to stand alone. Even if that means like Jesus on that shore in John chapter 6, when all of the thousands of people left him because he wasn't going to give them what they want, he turns to the twelve and he says, are you going to leave me too? And they say, no. You have the words of life. Beloved, we have the words of life. We have the words of life. Let's not be duped. Let's not be taken. 
Let's not be overrun by that which is false. Let's pray together. Lord, sometimes when we come to the study of your word, it's like getting in a race car. We hit the throttle and we just go so fast. That's what it seems like this morning, Lord, as we thought through these things and challenged our own hearts. Lord, the world around us is such a dangerous place, not because of what is happening in it, but because it hates you. And therefore, it hates those who stand with you. We know the world hates the Christian. It's becoming ever more and more visible, even in our world. And Lord, as we live for your glory, I trust that you would cause us to stand in strength, fitted well with the armor that you have given us, entrusting ourselves to you, even if that means we must stand alone. Give us courage. Cause us to be bold. Cause us to stand strong knowing that your word is true and right, even if everyone goes the other direction. We know you will care for us. You have promised to do so. We know that we are secure and safe in your hands, that nothing can happen to us unless you allow it for your glory and our good. So Lord, allow us by your grace. Would you be merciful as we exercise even our feeble faith to trust that? May we be strong for you, not fearing the things of the world, but only fearing you. We love you. Use us for your great glory, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.